important. But I wanted to start by telling you how, how God provided for us. You know, I asked you a question earlier. Um, what are you hoping for? <clears throat> I hope you're hoping. <laughs> I hope you're hoping for something greater than just you can do. Are you hoping for something greater than just you can pull off or perform or create or generate or multiply? Um, we've been believing God for some pretty big things. We, we were in a revival. Um, is this awkward? Are we good? Okay, just checking on you. She's funny. She's a little shy, but she actually is the better speaker of us. Of us. That is very true. So uh, we were in a revival in uh, Perry, Florida at a precious church, we were trusting God for a motor home. And it was so funny because Jody's sister, Lori, asked her, um, well, are you guys going to get a motor home? Jody said, oh, yeah, we're going to get a motor home. We're going to travel. We're going to do this thing. God's called us. We're going to do it. And her sister said, uh, well, are you going to finance it? Or, you know, what can you spend? How much money? She said, we don't have any money. And we can't finance it because we're both, like, self-employed now. So we have no jobs. So, uh... It's, you know what I found about banks and credit unions? If you don't have an income, they don't really want to loan you any money. That's just how, that's just how it works. I mean, I really didn't think about it because I had always had a job before. But anyway, so she said to her sister, or her sister said to her, um, how are you going to get it? And Jody said, God's going to give it to us. And her sister said, oh, Okay. <laughs> Has anybody ever said okay to you after you said God was going to do something in your life? And she didn't mean it in a bad way. It's just the average person, when you say that God has, you know, called you to do something, listen, when God's called you to do it, it's not on you to provide it. It's on Him to provide it. It's His responsibility to open the door and make a way and figure it out. And, and my problem is I'm a control freak. Could I get a witness in the house? I want to control, I want to know what the outcome's going to be before I decide I'm going to be a part of it. Ooh, I think that's wicked. I'm, I'm pretty sure it is. Because let me ask you a question. Where's the faith in that? Do, do you know how many miracles of God we miss, church, because we had to do it ourselves and we had to know and we had to be in control? Oh, my goodness. I'm preaching to somebody in here. Maybe it's just me I'm preaching to. But when we let go and let God have his way, let me tell you what God did. We went to this revival. We preached in the school and in the church. I think I had preached like eight times. Came to the Thursday night. We're supposed to be closing the revival. God just did amazing things. We saw about 18 people come to Christ. God was really, really working and on the scene. And this 17-year-old girl comes up to us, sweet as she could be. And she said, I don't know how to tell you all this. But God told me during the service to give you $100,000. Now, let, let me tell you something for, for you faithless ones in here. Those of you who've lost your hope. God can do it. And He will do it in a way that you have not even thought of. And He will use somebody that you thought could not help you every time. <laughs> have you found that to be true? So, and here's the neat thing. Right now in your life, God is preparing a way for you to be able to restore your marriage, restore your children. He's preparing a way to fix the business and financial problems that you are having. He's already doing it as I speak. All He's waiting on is for you to believe that He can and He will. You hear me? So, one year ago before this girl promised us this hundred thousand dollars she was on her way to school and a logging truck was being driven by a man who was intoxicated he fell asleep at the wheel and hit her head on in her little car it's a miracle she was alive this this was one year before she gave us the money god knew we didn't even know these people god knew at that accident and her pain and her suffering and her tears and her knee surgeries and her one year long recovery was going to lead to the answer to prayer that we had been praying for that whole year. Now if we can wrap our feeble human brains around the fact that God is already 
doing what He wants you to believe Him for. He's just waiting for us to get on board with Him. He always does it in a way you don't think He's going to. That's, that's why it's a miracle. He always uses people you think He would never use. That's why it's so flabbergasting, even though we were asking Him for it. Have you ever asked God for something and He just gave it to you and you were like, are you kidding me right now? Well, did you believe? We shouldn't even be surprised. And that's the kind of God that we serve. This girl gives us two checks for $50,000, which messed us up a little bit with the IRS, but that's another whole story. Gave us two checks for $50,000, And in the meantime, God already knew that this little elderly couple that lived four miles away from us in Jackson, Georgia, had put this motorhome in one of those air-conditioned, they have money, in an air-conditioned warehouse where it was just sitting there being preserved for what we are doing now. We we went and visited this little couple. He wanted $70,000 for it. We had $100,000. But I'm trying to be a good steward of God's money. I said, you know what? We can use this money for more than just to buy a motorhome. We can really use this for ministry for years to come if we're careful with it. So I told the guy what we were, he, well, he asked me. He said, well, I want 70000 for it. I said, well, he said, what are you going to do with it? And I said, well, everywhere we go in your motorhome, we're going to tell people about Yeshua. We're going to tell, we're going to tell teenagers and moms and dads little boys, little girls, how they can have a relationship and make peace with God. By the way, church, you can't have the peace of God until you make peace with God. You hear me? So he said, oh, well, if, that, if that's what you're going to do with it, then I'll let you have it for 52000 So we got a $198,000 motorhome, which he was asking $70,000 for. Beyond any, we, so we thought we were going to be traveling around in a C-class mini Winnie. Yeah. Uh, we didn't care. We didn't care. We just wanted a home on wheels so that we didn't have to stay in uh, four hotels in six days. We 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 just we just knew that was the will of God. And listen, He provided for us, and and He was already planning it, working it out in the lives of other people, making it true as we were mustering up the faith to believe that He could do it. And that's our God. That's our God. And He has provided for us. It's neat, the, the little uh, tow car that is behind it. We just started saying, well, listen, if God could provide the motorhome, He could certainly provide a tow car. So we started praying about the tow car. And uh, this company, uh, Bennett International Trucking, just sent us an email one afternoon. All the family was gathered. We were just hanging out. And I got this email, and it said, oh, by the way, we want to give you $5,000 so you can get a little tow car for a year. I mean, God has just, that's, that's our God. Do we believe Him? That is the question today. Will you trust Him? in your marriage, in your business, for your finances, and even if you're at the lowest point you are at in your life, or if you're on a mountaintop this afternoon, I'm telling you, God is faithful. He is. We are not faithful, but He is always faithful. So let me, let me share with you these three things, and Jody, you just interrupt me if you want to, um, well, because I, I we have... Say yeah. one thing. Um, <clears throat> you think that these things wonderful things happen you know because you're just trying to be faithful and you're in the word and you're you know you're getting speaking engagements and ministry opportunities and um this all happened in covid when we i was at home could not go anywhere because of cancer i couldn't be around people um we had cancellations right and left i mean our calendar went from 20 to like four events you know and and i just thought well you know what we're not going to do anything. We're not going to do anything. I mean, we all, always are doing stuff for the Lord, but I thought, we're not going to do anything that we think we, you know, we're doing for the Lord. And he just said, sit tight. I'm getting you ready, you know. And all this happened, you know, those first six months of COVID and us being housebound and everyone else being housebound and churches closing their doors. And, um, and again, it's not when you would think you're going to expect it. You would think that it was out of the gate the first year we started Survivor Thrive or, or 15 years down the road when, you know, you're veterans at it. No, you know, we're going to, you, you know, you're starting sc- over on, for scratch, you know, the second year. And that's when he showed up and, and you know, provided. And it was just it's such a God story. 
Such a good thing. It's so neat that first year we had about 35 events. I mean, there's a lot of evangelists who've been on the road for years who don't have 35 events a year. And God showed us, I'm going to do, hey, I'm going to open the door. He showed us that in that first year, I'm going to open the door. But he also showed us, I want you to be faithful and trust me. And I want you to do what I've asked you to do regardless of the circumstances. Mm -hmm. See, our, our circumstances should never dictate our response, ever. Mm -hmm. This will help somebody's marriage right here. Well, if she hadn't, have you ever said that? Well, if he hadn't, have, have you ever said that? See, our circumstances should not, we ought to be more mature than that. We ought to have more faith in God than that. And if, if I've ever failed, then why would I be so upset if she ever fails? You follow me? And so... Um, well, I think that first step that he preached this last session about faith, it brought it home. COVID brought it home. Mm. You know, it was me and him in the house together. Y'all know, y'all experienced that. Um, and so it was a, a testing of, are you going to live it with your wife, and with your husband? Are you going to live it with your, your widow next door? Because now you can't really go on the road. So are you going to minister to your true mm -hmm. neighbors, love your neighbor as yourself? We started putting into the simple things back into practice. And, you know, and then we have, a, we have a potter's house down the road, which is a scriptural a recovery uh, house for women who have addictions. And we just said, you know what, we'll come on Wednesday night do a Bible study. We'll come and just minister to that small group of women. I, I real, it's true. If you're faithful in the little things that he tells you to, and we just believe that last year, COVID year, was a year to get back to the basics, get back to simple truth, start practicing on a daily basis. And um, I, I just think that's the way God honored. It's so neat. God gave us a house. Uh, and, and put us where we live now in this beautiful little 80s brick home. is perfect for us because our kids are, are moved on. Uh, he put us right between two widows. Mm -hmm. One is a, a Jehovah's Witness. The other uh, lady, uh, her husband was diagnosed with cancer right after we met them, and he was dead in four months. So here we are with two widows, mm -hmm. and I'm out there mowing their lawn and mm -hmm. fixing their electrical and <laughs> doing plumbing and you know whatever they need for us to do and it was like the spirit of god was just saying to us you got to do it at home you got to do it with your neighbors you got to do it across the street you got to go over there you know to milner and do it at the potter's house and if you'll be faithful with that then i would listen if we start small we start small and i don't know how good or how bad things are in your home right now but you start small i tell teenagers all the time what does your room look like right now <laughs> right. Uh, did you make your bed this morning? Well, why should I make? Well, why should you brush your teeth? Well, why should I? What? Well, why should you take a shower? You're just gonna stink again tomorrow, right? No, no. These are disciplines of disciple. Go home and start small. Start with a little communication. Start with some good, intimate questions. Start by saying, I'm sorry. Somebody needs to just, that needs to be the first two words out of your mouth. You get in the car from here and say, I'm sorry. Boy, that's, there ain't no better reset than that right there. Sorry for what? Uh, you don't even have to list it. They know what you're sorry for. You're sorry. <laughs> that's what? I'm sorry. That's an apology. And so it's beautiful. Hey, let me share this with you. Here's why it's so hard for us to believe. You say, well, Pastor Kevin, this seems very simple-minded. I know we should put this on a billboard. Just believe. How do I believe? And what is it that keeps me from believing? So let me give you this to you, and you may want to jot some of this down. First of all, here are the questions that keep us from believing. The first one is, why does it have to be so hard? Why does it have to be so hard? I mean... I mean, I gave my life to Yeshua. I'm following him. I'm reading his word. I'm trying to be the best husband I can be. I'm trying to be the best wife I can be. Why, why does it have to be so hard? Have you ever asked that question? Just a few days ago, I was laying under the motorhome with wires hanging out, trying to figure out why the running lights were not working. Probably something I messed up changing fuses and, and I and I stuck my head out Jody will tell you this is true I stuck my head out I got grease on my hands and face and I looked at her and I said why does it have to be so hard and she said it has to be hard it has to be hard here's why it has to be hard when you get down to nothing God is up to something That's right. see if you have everything then what do you need God for 
If it's easy, then where is the faith? See, if it was easy, then you'd start to believe it was you and you would just trust in you. Why does it have to be so hard? Because the right way is usually the hard way and God likes doing things the right way. Could I get an amen? If it was easy, it wouldn't stay. If success was easy, everybody'd have it. The easy way does not require a miracle. The easy way does not require faith. I, I like to use the example of a Super Bowl. You know, when I was an eight, nine, ten year old boy, I had a Super Bowl in my pocket all the time. If you didn't, that's like having a pocket knife now. You know, you, you got to have a Super Bowl. I mean, you're nothing if you don't have a Super Bowl. That Super Bowl is made to bounce off of hard objects. If I bounce a Super Bowl off of a carpeted floor or off of a soft pew, it is never going to reach the height it was intended. May I say to you today, Christian, you are a Super Bowl. You were designed to be bounced off of hard objects. The harder it is, the higher you go. Are you hearing me? Okay, I'll try to calm down. You're a Super Bowl. The next time you ask yourself, why does it have to be so hard? It has to be hard. It's designed to be hard. Because if it wasn't hard, you wouldn't put your faith and trust in Christ. And you'd have no hope and you'd have no capacity to love. And then you wouldn't really live the life that God has designed for you. It has to be hard. And then number two, here's another question that keeps us from believing. Why does it have to be hidden? Why does it have to be hidden? Well, thank you, my friend. Because you always hide the good stuff. Come on now. Huh? The Krispy Kreme donuts. The double stuffed Oreos. The ranch Doritos. Huh? The dark chocolate. Somebody in this room has a stash of candy from October and your spouse doesn't know about it. Am I right? You... You always hide the good stuff. Why? Because the good stuff is not for everyone. Listen, you have guests over, and you pull out the good stuff. Isn't that right? Boy, we came into their home yesterday, sat down out there on that patio, and she had the good plates and the good... Am I right? The good silverware. And they had thought it through, and they had planned it. Why? Because the good stuff's not for just anybody. Am I right? You say, well, you know, I, I trust God, and I believe... Well, let me ask you a question. Can God trust you with the good stuff? Because if He can't, that's why it's been hidden from you. Did you know that for the Old Testament saints, the gospel itself was a mystery? They did not understand the church of the living God. They never understood the ecclesia. It was a mystery. It was hidden. Listen, the good stuff from God is discovered by faith. If you have no faith, you have no hope. You're not going to find that Halloween candy from last October. Huh? He always hides the good stuff. There's so many things I could say. Do you know why Jesus taught in parables? It was to reveal truth, right? But if you look at Matthew 13, 13 and 14, it says, This is why I speak to them in parables. This is Yeshua speaking. Though seeing they do not see, though hearing they do not hear or understand, in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will never, you will ever be hearing, but never understanding. You will ever be seeing, but never perceiving. Jesus taught in parables not just to present truth, but to conceal truth from those who refused to believe he was the Messiah. You hear me? It has to be hidden. Why? That's part of the adventure. Is it scary standing up here when I'm preaching? <laughs> That's part of the adventure. <laughs> Listen, this whole thing that we're doing together, it's an adventure, Pastor PJ. We never know when a tire's going to blow out. Woo! We never know what's going to happen. It's an adventure. And if you go into it with the right attitude and the right spirit, and every day that you get up, you say, God, I'm on an adventure with you. And the reason I'm not worried and I'm not scared and the reason I'm going to worship today is because you're in control. I'm not. And because you have all the resources I need, I don't. And so I'm going to trust you with my life. It's an adventure. It has to be hidden. Why? Because if it wasn't hidden, you wouldn't trust him. Or we'd be too scared. 
be too scared because if God revealed it all out, we would be too frightened. I, I often say that if God showed you what he has next in your life for your marriage and for your family, you'd run out of here with your hair on fire. You wouldn't be able to handle it. Your, our feeble, finite minds could not take it. And so he reveals it to us in mystery. He hides away some of it and he only gives us what we can handle in the moment. Be thankful for that. It has to be hidden. And then third, thirdly, and this is, this is important. Why did that have to happen? And see, this is, this is where some of you lost your faith. This is where some of you set God aside for a little while in your life and you, you had to fake it when you came to church and you're not really reading or memorizing or meditating on His Word. You, you, you had to do that because something happened in your life that you thought was an injustice that God should have never allowed or God should have never done. And it has caused you to lose your faith. In Yahweh. This is important because, listen, when I was a little child, grew up in a trailer park, I was sexually molested for five years. No five to ten year old should go through that. And yet today it is common. I want to tell you something. For a long time I was mad at God. And I would say, like most carnal Christians or unsaved people would say, why would you allow that to happen? To an innocent child. That happened to me. And I carried that shame and that pain and that guilt. Even though I was the victim, I carried it. I carried it. But you know, now that I'm on the other side of that, what the, what the enemy meant to destroy me with is now a weapon in my hand that I can stand up and knock the enemy back with because he meant it for evil. But God allowed it for good. When you can get to a place where you can actually say, I'm glad it happened. That's tough. Well, it's a survivor who's thriving. Yes, it's a survivor who's actually thriving. They've actually taken the evil that was done to them and they say to everyone and to themselves, I'm not going to be a victim. Listen, I'm not going to be a victim of that anymore. Mm -hmm. now, we drove through that trailer park with my youngest son. He said, Dad, show me where you used to live when you were a kid. We pulled into Pools Mobile Manor and I got emotional. Well, first of all, the place looked smaller. <laughs> the, isn't that funny how that, it looked like I was in a like, matchbox cars and, you know, a little a dollhouse or something. Anyway, we pulled up to the exit. I drove him around, showed him where our little single wide trailer used to be in the pool and the washeteria and the woods where we used to ride and hang out. And we pulled up to the exit of that and Ruach, the Spirit of God, said to my heart, you don't live here anymore. <sighs> Big old tears start rolling down. Cole said, Dad, you all right? I was emotional anyway, because when you go back to a childhood place, a place that has a lot of wonderful, fond memories and good things, but also some very tragic things. I drove by some places where some things happened to me, and I didn't realize it was going to affect me the way that it did. And I pulled up to the exit of that place, and the Spirit of God said, You don't live there anymore. Glory to God! Are you hearing me? Some of you, you're still living there. You were the victim of something. Something happened to you. It was not your fault. God didn't do it. Some bad people did it. And if you can ever come to a place where you say, God, listen to the best of my ability and with your help I forgive them. Even if you're not feeling it, forgiveness is not an emotion. There's emotion involved. Forgiveness is a decision. Are you hearing me? And I began to forgive those who had molested me and God freed me from that and reminded me, I don't live there anymore. And somebody needs to hear this. You can trust Him even though that thing, whatever it is, happened in your life. You can trust Him. He can be trusted. And you can get to... See, God wants to do something through you. But He can never do anything through you before He does something in you. And He knows what it's going to take that's why it has to be hard. And that's why it has to be hidden. And that's why it had to happen. And this man, forgiveness should happen in this room this afternoon. I know that. I know that. Forgive. Forgive. But I know it wasn't injustice. It was wrong. There's no way to rectify that. Just forgive it so that you can be released from it. Who I could preach that all afternoon. 
It's hard. It's hidden. It had to happen. Why? Because if it didn't, you wouldn't trust Him. Don't you know that He'll do anything, anything to draw you to Himself? He loves us that much. Uh -huh. There is no scenario in your life that God will allow where He is unnecessary. That's right. Did you hear what I said? If God has become unnecessary in your marriage, in your parenting, in your business, in your hobbies, you're in a dangerous place. You know why? Because He'll do whatever it takes to get you back to Him. That sounds like an evangelist preaching, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, church, what is it? What is it in your life today that you've been carrying for a long time that you absolutely have got to let go of? You've got to let go of it. It's going to destroy you. It's going to destroy you. And, and yes, if you're a child of God, you will hit those pearly gates and you will be in heaven for all of eternity with Yeshua. But what would you have missed out on in this life? What miracles are you missing? How good could your relationship be? This young couple right here, I, I knew her before uh, she met you. She's wonderful. You better be good to her. You hear me right now? I'm just talking like a daddy right now. Okay. And she's wonderful too. Um, and she said, wow, since we've seen each other, she said, I got married and I'm expecting a baby. And I said, congratulations. And I was just saying to them, this marriage thing doesn't have to be that hard. It really doesn't. We humble ourselves. We work on our personal relationship with God. And then we come together and we share what all God is doing in our lives personally. And then we serve Him together. I'm telling you, it can be that way. It can be that way. And maybe one day you guys will be as perfect as we are. No. <laughs> You're crazy. Why did you say no? You're great. You're nothing crazy. <laughs> all right, crazy. amen. Hey, let us, all right, that's the end of session one. Let, let, let us share a couple more things. Can, can we share a couple things with you together? Um, we were at a marriage conference recently, and we were uh, reminded of some things that I think are just really neat. Um, one there's a number of beautiful things about marriage. One is discovering each other. Yeah. Discovering. Um, I remember one of the guys was talking about the rings. There's like seven rings of marriage, you know, like rings, like the engagement ring, the marriage ring, you know, the, and he talked that about like these some and some of those. Um, we, we just want to talk about two of them because I think that they're really important. And this is discovering because isn't that part of the excitement when you first get married? <clears throat> so, so let's figure out in here today who has been married the least amount of time and then we will all laugh at them. Okay? <laughs> so, uh, how, so how long have y'all been married? Two years. Two years. So she's lying. And so could I get the <laughs> truth from you? No, no, I'm just kidding. So a uh, year, a year and a few months, is that what you're? A year and a few months. Anybody been married in here less time than that? You've never been married. Congratulations to you. Let's give it up for the man who's the smartest one in the room. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Whenever I go and speak for college groups, like I'll usually open up by saying, hey, I have two things for you today. Never get married. Never have children. You will be the happiest people on the planet. And they're like, did you actually say that? So uh, congratulations to you, sir. Um, so who's been married in here for 40 years or more? 40 years, okay. 40, 40, 40, 40. 55. Anybody been married more than 55? Okay, how long? 56. Yes. 56. Oh, I'm so sorry for your loss. And so how long were you married? 55? 55 years? Oh, you don't know. You, do, will you do the math for us since you're not married? <clears throat> 62 years. Give it up. Wow. 62 years she was married. Awesome. One of the neat things about being married to someone else is discovering them. Discovering them. It's funny when... <clears throat> I'll shut up in a minute. When Jody and I got married, we dated six years. She made me wait a long time. <laughs> Um, and we waited. Um, we, we didn't sleep together. We didn't have sex before marriage. We waited. 
and we were pretty traditional in that. And I'm glad that we did because now um, I still find her as attractive as I did the day I saw her on that school bus winking at me. I wasn't winking. Okay, she said she okay. wasn't winking. Um, so anyway, we got we got married. We went to the hotel um, that's near the airport, and the next day we were supposed to fly out to Kauai, right? Take an island hopper, and we already had like the hotel and or whatever it was. So if I don't tell this right, correct me. We get to the hotel. She says, okay, I'm going to take a bath. I said, well, I'm so thirsty. Because, you know, you go around, you talk to people. You don't really eat the food that you paid for for the wedding. You know, you, <laughs> and so, so we, I went down to the bar and got a Coke and a Diet Coke. I probably look like a, a Christian idiot. It's probably what I like. And a, and a bucket of ice. And I came back and I didn't bring the room key. Well, she's in the bathtub running the water. I'm still in my tuxedo. So I sit down outside the door. I knock, knock, knock. She doesn't hear me. I sit down outside the door with the bucket of ice and the Diet Coke and Coke. And everybody that went by said, sorry, man. Sorry, <laughs> sorry man. I'll say a prayer for you. Sorry, brother. You know, because it looked like she had locked me out of the hotel. So, so, we, so we go in. I go, she finally lets me in. She's like, what are you doing out here? I'm out here waiting to come in, you know. And, and I've waited all this time to be with my bride and to consummate our relationship. And, and so I said, okay, well, I'm going to take a quick shower. So I take a quick shower. I get out of the shower. She's dead asleep. <laughs> Sawing logs out. So I'm a gentleman. So I just lay down beside her <laughs> on our honeymoon night and went to sleep <laughs> then the next morning when we woke up we woke up late and our flight was leaving like in one hour and we were flying non-rev standby because i worked for delta airlines you have to be at the gate like an hour before so like we were way so we grabbed our stuff threw on our clothes jumped on the little shuttle bus went to the airport got up in first class flew nine and a half hours still had not <laughs> consummated our relationship she trust me she didn't care i cared very much i waited okay so we get, we get to our condo, and it has burned to the ground. If I'm lying, I'm dying. Crime scene tape, police officer, still smoldering. Yes. <laughs> and I looked up at the heavens, and I said, Dear God, I waited. And so anyway, they put us up at Leonani in the North Shore. It, it was like... It was like 36 hours I had been married and I had never seen my wife naked. <laughs> there is something wrong with that. <laughs> so you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Discovering. <laughs> it's a journey. It's an adventure. You don't know what's going to happen. You have to take it in stride. Is it frustrating sometimes? Absolutely. Absolutely. But I think that that story may help us <laughs> understand this point of discovering. So, Jojo, what do you want to share? <clears throat> well, it doesn't matter if you're two years in or 60 some years in there's always something new to discover and you know and, and I guess the key to this little session is um, how do you respond to that new discovery because you have a choice you know he's I, he's not real great with directions and so <laughs> I, I get lost everywhere I go so right, it used to be that I would say you missed your turn. You know, it was not in a nice, good tone as I was trying to remind him that he made a mistake, you know. But then my teenage daughter, who I guess is much more wiser than I am, would watch the map or watch the GPS on the phone, and she would say, Dad, you have a decision to make. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and then he would take, you know, note of where he was at, you know. And so now we kind of use that little phrase like, uh, you have a decision to make in your response to whatever it is that's coming up ahead. And that, that um, response needs to always be with um, love and acceptance. So I know that's hard sometimes. Again, you can't love until you have hope. Until you, and hope is a basis of, of what you believe and what your faith is. It goes back to this morning session. So you just have to remember that I'm going to do it with acceptance and love um, as you respond to what newness comes through. Yeah. I love this, the scripture that says, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. It literally means um, ask a question. Yeah. And see, ladies, I know you know what I'm talking about because you guys have mastered the art of saying, Honey, don't you want to turn up here at this next line? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Y'all have mastered the art of asking me. questions. Or, <laughs> some, she says, not me. I'm we, ha learning. we haven't discovered your um, personality and your <laughs> gift. Yeah, yeah. We, we, were, we were talking last night about temperaments and personalities, and that, that, that does come into play. 
But some of you ladies will intentionally wait until he passes the right turn. And then you will say, missed your turn. <laughs> missed your turn again. Am I right? Well, it's quiet in here this <laughs> afternoon now. But um, Jody's right. Acceptance and love. What would our marriage be like if we just muted ourselves for like a nanosecond and said, whoop, I better think about what I'm going to say before I say it. We do that with strangers. Mm -hmm. You do it with your best friend because you don't, I don't want to say she's fat because I don't want to offend her, but she needs to change clothes. That outfit don't look good on her. But, but you'd never tell her why because you'd offend her. But then you'll come in to your spouse and say something that's so hurtful. So yeah, with acceptance and love, these are our responses. We respond with acceptance and love. Have, has your husband ever had a really bad idea? <laughs> no, I'm waiting for somebody to say, oh yeah, can I testify right there? <laughs> Well, he doesn't know. And you have to help him. Am I right? I mean, we could switch this. Has your wife ever had a really bad idea? Could I get an amen in here? A low amen. Yeah. You know better, don't you? <laughs> yeah. But how we respond, if we respond with acceptance, well, let's, well, yeah, I haven't thought of that. See, that's an honest answer because you hadn't thought of that because it's idiotic. Right? Yeah, you have never thought of that. But with acceptance and love, if we'll just temper our response, it would change our whole marriage. Yeah. Acceptance and love. And yeah. I think the older <clears throat> I have gotten, because I'm such a people pleaser, that I feel like I want, I feel like I need to tell them what I think they're wanting to hear. And so, but now that I've gotten older. She doesn't do that anymore. I don't do that. <laughs> I have come up with it. I have come to the realization that I, it's okay to say, you know what? I have no opinion on that, <laughs> or I don't really want to make that decision, or, and how freeing is that to where I don't have to make a right decision, because I am a C, and I want to give the correct answer. <laughs> so true. All right, number two, remember your commitment. When, when things do go bad, remember your commitment. We, we yeah. talked a lot about this two years ago when we did one little session with you guys at the Feast of the Tabernacles, where we talked about, you know, commitment and communication and compromise. compromise yeah. you, you know, just like the word is our plumb line, our truth, you've got to go back to what it is in marriage. And it is the commitment that you made in front of God and witnesses and what the Bible says that a marriage should be like. You have to be committed to that truth. Hard times, good times, no matter what. You made a commitment. I mean, some of us, any deer hunters in here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you've been hunting that spot mm -hmm. for years. You're committed. And, and like that 160 class buck that's in my backyard, the 10 pointer with 24 inch spread and the nine inch tines, I've been hunting him for years and I have never seen him in the daylight. That's why he's four and a half years old and not yeah. hanging on my wall. But you know what? I still put the corn out there. I still, I still make sure there's a salt block. I still set my trail cameras. I still get up bef at dark 30 and get in my deer stand. And do y'all understand what I'm saying? Maybe the men, maybe the ladies don't, but it don't matter because I'm actually preaching to the men right now. Um, you made a commitment. That sounds rude. You made before God and witnesses. I don't care how hard it gets. You ain't going to quit hunting. You're not going to quit fishing. One more cast. Yeah. This is the last cast. <laughs> how many times have we said that, man? One more cast. Yeah. I ain't done fishing. I still got bait in the bucket. <laughs> right? I still got room in the live well. I ain't done. The sun's going down. You made a commitment to your wife. Keep it. Yeah. Do whatever it takes. Keep your commitment. Okay. We'll, we'll keep our commitments to our lunch date with our friend or mm. our doctor's appointment or you know the, the the child with her his schooling you know i mean there's commitments at all these different places in our lives but the greatest commitment is our commitment to the lord and our commitment to our mate mm. whether they're appealing at that moment or whether they're annoying at that moment you got to still make that commitment i like that appealing or annoying you sound like a preacher <laughs> Yeah, and then um, number three is don't try to change them. The only person you can control is yourself. In fact, the one in the marriage that probably needs the most work is not your spouse. Yeah. 
That, did you know the problem in your marriage is not your spouse? You say, well, you don't know my spouse. Um, the problem in your marriage is a problem between you and the one who gave you that spouse. That's right. Right? Get that right, and you will adore your spouse. We, um, the Potter's House that we, we you know, go and do Bible study with, the founder of that, she was a Christian young lady, and she wrote a book about, <laughs> I, I titled the book is something about change him or strike him dead or yeah. some crazy God, will topic. you please change him change or I'm going to kill him yeah, or, or something, something like that. Something crazy like that. But as a Christian, she chose to marry someone who was a um, total non-believer. In fact, he was an atheist. And for the first 20 years of their marriage, she was trying to change him. I mean, she was. Just, you know, if anybody can do it, I can do it, you know? And... Um, but the whole story is that she began to just start looking introspectively at herself and and her testimony and she served the the Lord with these women in her church which eventually developed into a potter's house and and he saw God show up in such unbelievable ways in her life and the ministry he didn't care that she was serving the Lord and wanted to have you know this ministry but when he started to see how he worked in her life in the lives of those women um, you know him. You know Ariel. Ariel. He um, we'll cut his grass. He knows the Lord and you know goes to church now and is such a wonderful supporter of what God has called her to do. Again, a, as an individual, um, that there's always hope. I mean, that part of it is that that she had hope that God was going to change him. And that's the harrowing message today. That there's hope. There's you say, well, there's there's no hope. There's always hope. If you're alive and breathing, there's always hope. And so we only really have about six minutes okay. until we do the breakout. So I'm assuming we need to try to do we'll that by do four. These. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, let's just mention these. Appreciate <laughs> your differences. He mentioned that in the first message. But remember, that's what is exciting because if you don't know, I'm very much of an introvert. And I don't want to be in the spotlight. He can have the spotlight. But because... He's such an extrovert. I, he, I'm drawn to him. And, and so he's very different, and I appreciate his differences. And then he likes me that I think things through, and I make the list, and I double-check stuff, and, and it works because we are so different. And I don't. <laughs> right. <laughs> he's getting better at yeah. it. <laughs> and then number five is remember you are flawed. You are also flawed. You're not perfect. Isn't it funny how we act toward our spouse like we're perfect, oh, we like we answers. have it all together, yeah. and that's why we handle each other with grace. And then I think this is a great question about being, <clears throat> knowing that I'm flawed, knowing that he has flawed, but all the examples in the Word of God where he has used flawed people. Yes. I'm so thankful that they're in there and that they're real people because... Mm -hmm. I'm real, and I, I love him, and I serve him, and he can use me as a flawed person. And when you have an argument, or and you know what? There are always little nitpicky little arguments that begins to deteriorate a, deteriorate a marriage. I always ask this question, is this worth dying for? Is this worth fighting for? I mean, like, is it worth fighting for the soul and the wellness of a child? Absolutely. We're going to go hand in hand, and we're going to fight. Um, death, flesh, hell, everything. We're going to fight it with all we got. But really, that his sock is on the counter, you know, <laughs> I'm going to say, Ugh, and throw it in the dirty clothes, you know. Um, so I always decide, you know, is this really worth worth dying for? She's because almost got not. me trained. She, she's almost. almost got us trained. Yeah, yeah. And then pray, and I, pray about it. Pray together. Do, do you guys pray together um, as a couple? Pray together. Pray together. If, if you'll... If you're mad at each other, that is the best time. You say, well, I have to get myself right. Oh, you ain't never going to get yourself right. That's pride right there. And pride's going to keep you from making it right. So if, if you're having a problem, listen, one of the best ways when your wife is acting crazy is to gather her up like this and say, let me pray for you. Mm -hmm. It's humbling oh, for you it both. Diffuses it, it diffuses it. Yeah, yeah. So and it keeps everything, pray together. And it keeps everything um, <clears throat> open. And like last night, the sweetness around our dinner table of just reflecting on, am I sinning against God? Am I, am, I, am I not doing right in my role and responsibility as a wife and as a mother, as a Christian, as a neighbor? And the Lord reveals those. And to be able to just clean it out mm. let it out 
marriages don't get in a bad state if that's happening on a regular that's basis. Right. That's why we do it. Mm. That's why we do it. And then lastly, find out how you can help. You know, we actually have to listen to our spouse. We have to listen to what they're saying. We have to read between the lines. We have to listen to what they're not saying, the subjects they're avoiding. And we have to know them intimately in order to be able to offer our help. And so, all right, we have like two minutes. So I, um, I think this can be done in our breakout. Okay, let's do that. Okay. Yeah. But I do want to end with this. <clears throat> Four Ds of a good formula for a marriage. Dialogue. Dialogue daily. Mm. First D, dialogue. Second D, do it daily. you got to have that communication date. Mm. I, I, you know, I'm not much of a dater. I am a homebody. I'll stay at home all day long, and it, I, I'm okay with it. But we have to initiate that time where we get out of the house, not doing the routines, not working on the DIY projects, not doing the laundry. Or we, you got to do something out of the norm. And Even if we just run to the coffee shop yes, and get a coffee. Yes. I mean, you, because then you're sitting there with your coffee, and, and you will talk. You yeah. will dialogue. It will mm -hmm. be, uh, will be so good. So dialogue, do it daily, date, maybe... I don't know, set it up once a week or once a month or whatever, and then distance. When we first heard this, we were like, get away from each other? Yes. They're like, no, 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 no. Y'all need to go away for a distance, which is why we went to that marriage retreat a couple of weeks ago. But, you know, plan on a, a trip a year or two trips a year. So if you think about it, dialogue, daily, date, and distance. And, and those are just good things because it helps you, it helps you become intentional in that mm -hmm. if you put it on the calendar most of us nowadays we're so busy that if we don't put something on the calendar it does not get done right our, our calendars will take priority over our marriages our families our children yeah because the calendar rules well i have an appointment you know well then let's make our wives our husbands uh, one of our appointments and that'll help us mm -hmm. so i hope this has been good and practical and uh, we'll let pastor pj dismiss us however he wants to for the breakout you want, you want, I'm going to take a picture. All right, well, thank you guys. Let's give them a big hand.